made it. You made it through Christmas. Congratulations, you made it. And that is exciting. I think I even have a favorite graphic here just to give you a little encouragement this morning. Congratulations, you made it. Even the minions are proud of you this morning. You made it through the stress. You made it through the holidays. Almost. We got New Year's coming up. You made it through visiting the in-laws, the outlaws, <laughs> Cousin Eddie. You, you made it through. In fact, in the immortal words of Clark W. Griswold, ha ha, I did it. I did it. I made it. And you live to tell about it. This could be a stressful time of year. According to recent studies, this is absolutely the highest incidence they record of heart-related issues of people being put in the hospital during this week. It is the highest level of, well, higher than any other time of year. I love how David Jeremiah put it. He said, sometimes our traditions get out of control, and we have to put tradition in remission to avoid the mortician, <laughs> or at least the physician. And that is so true, and I love that because we're all stressed out on the holidays. We had so much stress to our lives, and we go through this end of the year analysis. And we're going to do that today. So, you know, I'm not going to knock it too hard. We're going to look at a spiritual checkup. But we do these physical checkups and we make these New Year's resolutions that are so ridiculous. What's your favorite New Year's resolution? Anyway, can you guess what the number one New Year's resolution is each year? Absolutely. You know what number two is? Here, let's look at a chart together. This is awesome. Eat healthier. Get more exercise. Save money. Save more money. And then it goes on and on down there. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you think 80% of the people keep these New Year's resolutions? Anybody? All right, how many people think 50% of the people keep these New Year's resolutions? 30? 30%? Anybody? Well, you don't have much faith in humanity. Eight. Eight percent of people usually end up keeping their New Year's resolutions. That is so crazy to me. And while it's great for us to want to lose weight and exercise more and start getting cardio and lifting weights and feeling stronger, and, and that's great, and there's nothing wrong with that, I wonder how many times we overlook the most important part, and that is taking our spiritual inventory, looking at our spiritual growth. There's a, there's a pastor named Stephen Hill, and he got together. He was so discouraged, apparently. He brainstormed for hours, and he came up with 50 questions to ask himself to do a spiritual inventory, to go through and say, you know, where are we? If I want to go deeper in my spiritual walk with the Lord, maybe I need to be asking better questions than a calorie count. Maybe I need to do something a little different this year. And he came up with 50, and I looked him over, and I whittled him down to 10, okay? So we're not going to go through all 50. But just to start this morning, I thought I would ask us my 10 favorite questions from this 50, just to help us know where we are on our journey as a Christ follower. Now, it's good to reflect on your health. You do not have to answer these out loud, Okay. Don't nudge your neighbor if you think something identifies. This is not about them. This is just between me, you, each other, and the Lord, okay? So I'm going to read these. Just relax, kick back, don't answer out loud. Question number one, do you have a growing awareness of God's presence in your life? It's a good question. Do you have a growing awareness of his presence in your life? Number two, are you increasingly aware of any sin in your life? When we read God's word, it's like a mirror. It's those sins, and the Holy Spirit speaks to us, and they should glow. We should think, you know what, Lord, that's not like you, Jesus. I want to confess that. I want to eliminate that. Are you aware increasingly as you go on and you get closer to the Lord of any sin in your life? Number three, is God's word challenging you? Is there something in God's word that you struggle with? Maybe something to embrace or something to implement in your life, or maybe there's something you struggle to understand. That's a good thing. Question number four. Are you pursuing God's plan for your life or your plan for your life? Question number five. Are, oh, I'm going to skip number five. That's, you you want to hear it? You sure? Kelly wants to hear it. All right, Kelly, just for you. Just, just me. All right, I'm going to read. I'm going to start. Are you growing in love? Are you sure you want to hear this one? This is a tough one. Randy, you ready for this? Are you growing? This is not directed towards Randy, by the way. I just saw him over there. Sorry. <laughs> Forget that. Okay, here we go. Are you growing in love for those who are difficult for you to love? See, I should have skipped it, right? We should have skipped that one. Number six, is there any discipline to your spiritual growth? Or is it kind of haphazard? Are we more disciplined with our physical fitness regimen than we are our spiritual regimen. 
Mm. Number seven, how actively are you involved and invested in God's local church? Just answer these by yourself. <laughs> Just you and the Lord. Number eight, oh, this is a good one. I should skip this too, but I'm going to say it. Is your lifestyle noticeably different than your peers who don't know Jesus? Wow. Is your lifestyle noticeably different? Do they notice? There should be a difference between those who claim to know the Savior and those who don't, right? Number nine, is your relationship with God a source of great delight? I like that one. And then the last one, and you made it through, do you live with an increasing gratitude because of what God has done for you? That's pretty cool. What a great checkup. What a great checkup. You know, the reason why it's so important to do this every year is because we go to the doctor and we get checkups and we don't like to do that. And we go and we get these checkups and he says, here's where you are. But if we don't get challenged here, if we don't get stretched here to grow spiritually, where will you? Because it's certainly not going to happen out there in the world. They want to conform you into the world's image. But here, we want to conform into the image of Christ. Man, that's not fluffy. That's not popcorn, little happy prosperity gospel stuff. That's following Jesus. And it is not easy. This is some heavy-duty stuff. So we're going to look at Ecclesiastes today. And if I could give you one pearl of wisdom as we start this to frame this whole thing, it's don't try to do life alone. Don't go it alone. Don't even try to do change alone. We need each other. So open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 or pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the CSB translation if you have a digital translation. The CSB. Ecclesiastes 4. And we're going to start with verse 9 and read through verse 12. Everybody got it? All right, starting at verse 9, he says this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls. I can't help it. Anyone else think Mr. T right there? Is it just me? I pity the fool? Is it, nope, just me? Okay, all right. Pity the fool who falls without another to lift him up. Verse 11. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Now, I love to read multiple translations during the week when I'm studying. And so we're going to go to the message this week and just see it because it is just awesome. Every time it's something funny or something serious or it just comes out of the blue with a different angle, look at it with me starting in verse 9. It's better to have a partner than go it alone. Share the work, share the wealth. And if one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help, <laughs> tough. <laughs> I love it. Two in a bed, warm each other. Sounds like a nursery rhyme to me. Two in a bed, warm each other. Alone, you shiver all night. By yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? <laughs> Even better. A three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. And there it is, right there for us. God never intended for you to walk this road alone. He never intended us for us to follow Jesus in isolation. He never intended us to go at alone. We see his feelings about this all the way back in the very beginning, back in Genesis chapter 2 when he says, mm, that's good, that's good, that's good. Oh, it is not good for man to be alone. It's the only time he says that. That's not good. And he says, and that reveals his feelings, that he showed he created us to live in community with each other. And this just isn't some kind of safety in numbers spiel. This is a common sense biblical truth. Two can withstand a foe better than one. Whether it's creatively or spiritually or physically or emotionally, when we combine our strengths, we are better together. There's a synergy that happens, and we can do so much more together than we can apart. So what Ecclesiastes is telling us right out of the gate is this. There is comfort, companionship, and community when we get together. Comfort, companionship, compassion in the community that we have. And everyone needs this when we go through life. When you go through a difficult time, trust me, you want people with you. You want the love of another person. When you get together with friends and family and stuff, you feel that. It's like a, it's like a warm snuggie of affection on a cold winter's day or a normal day at the potter's hand where you have your snuggie. Think of it like this. Companionship and community is like a giant group hug. And who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to, to feel that? So with the new year just around the corner, and we're scribbling down our New Year's resolutions, 
we are not content to just talk about the changing the way we look, changing the way we weigh, changing the way we behave, or changing where we get our money, or how we job, or do these things. We want to go deeper. Almost every one of us fails at New Year's resolutions. If research is right and it's down to 8%, let me ask a question. Why do so many of us fail? There's a great book out written by Mr. Farazi, and he says this. He says, the reason we too often fail is because we attempt to go it alone. Man, that's great. We attempt to go it alone. That's the name of this message. Let me give you a real-life example. Has anyone remembered the name or even heard the name Gene Nidich? Anybody recognize that name? Okay, good. No one? Awesome. You will in just a second. Gene grew up as a typical American kid who battled with weight. She was overweight as a child. She would go on these strict extreme things or try diet pills and it would come off only to gain back all of it plus a little bit more. Through her teens, same thing. Straight up, straight back down. Through college, through 20s, through her 30s, she would go no matter what diet regimen or diet pills or whatever she tried, her waistline kept expanding all the way into her 30s and she ended up fitting the medical definition for obese and she said something has to change. No matter what she did, she continued to fall. In 1961, at the age of 38, she decided to do something about it, and she started a diet that was sponsored by the New York City Department of Health. After 10 weeks, she dropped 20 pounds, and then even more, and then even more, but something happened. Even though things were going well, and she looked like this at one point and changed her body into this, she began to lose motivation. And then she realized a powerful truth. She needed, she needed someone else to talk to for moral support. So she couldn't get her friends to come with her all the way down to, into downtown Manhattan. So what she decided to do was to take the science of her program to their living rooms in Queens and in the Bronx. And right there, a powerful concept was born. Jean and her friends would all lose weight together. You see what's happening here? This is, out of those first meetings, by the way, this company grew into something you might have heard of. Anybody guess what it is yet? You got it. Weight Watchers. Now it's a $4 billion annual company. And she's lost over 71 pounds now and has kept it off all the way until the time she went to be with the Lord. Here's the amazing part. Don't miss this. It is so simple, her concept. Losing weight requires community. This is so true. She held weekly meetings for encouragement. Does this sound familiar at all? She held weekly meetings so people could set goals and be accountable to one another and to share each other's struggles and to share each other's victories and have community. Her point was no one should walk this journey alone. What a great concept, y'all. That is a lesson for us in the church. This applies to our spiritual health as well. We need each other. We need community. We need that encouragement from each other. We need to be there for each other. We need to stop and listen. In fact, I promise I came this close to calling this sermon this right here. Stop, collaborate, and listen. Anybody know what that is? Vanilla ice, right? If he's got a problem, yo, he'll solve it. That's it. This is, this is why meeting together every few days is so important, church. Don't miss the truth here. Our spiritual health, meeting on Sundays, meeting on Wednesdays, mission trips, special events, small groups, we got to talk about these small groups. This is so important for our spiritual growth, for our encouragement, for accountability, to find prayer support. The larger we grow as a church, the smaller we go as a church. That's how you keep that sense of familial familiarity with each other, that, that bonding. We've launched two new ones just this past month. They both meet on the East Campus at 9 a.m. One's just for the ladies. You can see Karen or Louise about that. And a new one starting next week just for the guys, taught by Pastor Bill. It's going to be awesome. We need accountability. We need to plug in with this. You don't have to sign up. Just show up. They will be so happy to welcome you. And we will have this community. This is key to growing spiritually in 2019. Do you want your 2019 to be exactly the same as 2018? Or do you want it to go to the next level? As your pastor, I want to challenge you, and I want to ask you a very key question. Very probing question. But hopefully I have permission to do that as your friend. How committed to your spiritual health and your growth, would you say you are? Let's take a moment and look at that. Don't answer out loud. How committed to your spiritual health and your growth would you say you are? Now, notice what I didn't ask. I didn't ask, how committed do you want to be? 
And I didn't even ask, how committed should you be? Because that doesn't matter. My question is, where are you right now? So I like to do an evaluation of my own life. I think it's great for the church. This one's going to be a little bit more personal, okay? We're going to have some fun. Again, this is just between you and the Lord, so you might as well be honest. <laughs> he reads us like an open book anyway, okay? This is not about the person beside you. This is not about how you measure up to anyone else. This is just between you and the Lord, okay? So not if you're with me, you're safe here. You don't have to even answer these out loud. When you look at that question that's behind me on the wall, I want to ask you a follow-up question. As you relate that question to the local church and your family, your brothers and sisters here at Potter's Hand, how would you and where would you place yourself in this diagram? Thinking about that previous question, where do you feel you fit, okay? Just based on your first reaction, okay? Don't say it out loud. You got it? You got one of the outer layers all the way to the inside layer. Now, to help us decide which circle, I want to conduct a fun, quick, short interview with you. Just a little test. You don't have to write it down. You don't answer out loud. All you have to do is just keep up with your yeses or your noes. Very simple. Every question can be answered yes or no. All you have to do is remember, of the 10 questions I'm going to interview us with, how many yeses do you have? You need to know that number so that you have your answer. Are you with me? They start easy. I want everyone to be able to say yes to at least one or two questions, okay? But they do this. I'm just giving you a heads up, okay? Just to find out kind of where we are getting this is just simply where you are and where the Lord would have you be. Question number one. I have read or heard at least one verse from the Bible in my lifetime. <laughs> Man, I hope we can all say yes to that, okay? So you're doing good, right? You're one for one. Good for you. Number two. I own a Bible. That's it. I own a Bible, and I joyfully come to church twice a year, Christmas and Easter. How about that? We'll make it easy. You're a creaster. <laughs> Christmas and Easter. You're a two-timer, okay? Hopefully, every one of us here at least can say yes to those. Now, they get a little bit harder. Number three, I attend worship at least 50% of the time, and I give financially occasionally. Okay, so let me, let me put some meat on that. I attend worship, that's the community with others we're talking about, at least 50% of the time. That's every other week. So out of 52 Sundays we're here, you show up for 26 of them. It's not a really high bar, but in today's culture that might be something. Where do you fit with that? Okay, and I give financial occasion. Okay, this isn't tithing. I'm not talking about tithing or offerings above that. This is just, here's an occasional 25, here's 50 bucks, and, you know, that, just something like that, Okay. Can you say, how you doing so far? Anybody three for three? Don't say it out loud. Just keep up with your yeses. Number four, I am eager to study God's word, and I try to spend time alone with him often. I'm eager to study his word, and I try to spend time alone with God often. Got it? Got your yes or no? All right. Number five, I am happy to serve or teach in any capacity even when called on short notice, with a joyful and Christ-like attitude. <laughs> nursery. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> nursery. What's that? I am happy to serve or teach in any capacity that's needed. I'll do it on short notice, and I'll do it with a good attitude. How do you feel with that? Yes or no? Number six. I told you they go like this. Number six. I have personally invited at least two people to join me for any type of church event in the last year. Okay, any church, just not invited them to Sunday morning only. It could be a Wednesday night, it could be a refuel, it could be a concert, it could be ultimate date night, it could be movie night, anything. VBS. Okay, I have personally invited at least two people over the last 12 months. How are you doing so far? Everybody got, keep it up with your yeses, your noes. All right, number seven. I have accepted Christ, I've been baptized, and I faithfully support my local church with my prayers, my attendance, and my tithes. Okay? Now, this isn't the occasional giving. This is a tithe, a tenth. God provides 100% of everything we have. He allows us to keep 90% of it, and he asks to return 10% to him to advance his kingdom. That's a tithe. Okay? So that's different than number three. If you're able to say yes there, hopefully you'll be able to say yes to here. All right? That's number seven. Number eight. Whew. When the church doors are open, I can't wait to be there. If I'm in town and I have a pulse... You can count on me to be there, to be present with my Bible, excited to meet with God, excited to meet my fellow brothers and sisters, 
Sundays, Wednesdays, BBS, mission trips, special events, concerts, movie night outreach, you name it. I am excited, I am present and accounted for. Thank you, sir. That's number eight. How you doing? Getting awful quiet. <laughs> I love this. All right, here we go. Number nine. I am prepared, ready, and willing to share my faith anytime, anywhere, with anyone, and, wait for it, I actively look for opportunities to do so. Got your answer? Do I need to say it again? No. Prepared to share my faith anytime, anywhere, and I look for chances to do that. Number 10, I actively support the Lord through his local church by praying for my fellow members, by praying for my pastors, by knowing and using my spiritual gifts as I have opportunity, by protecting the unity of the church fiercely, by refusing to gossip or slander, by inviting the unchurched, and then when they come, willingly, joyfully leaving my comfort zone of friends and warmly welcoming those guests that I was asking God to bring. By the way, that's in our church charter for covenant and membership. It's powerful. So where are you? All right. Take a moment. Where you thought you were before we did this quiz and where you are today as your New Year's spiritual checkup. If you answered yes zero times or one, then you are part of the community. Welcome. <laughs> there's, there's no shame here. Everyone starts here. There's no shame in this circle. You are in the circle of trust, okay? There's no shame here. Well, there's shame if you've been in that for 55 years. If you haven't moved, you haven't graduated, haven't moved any closer to being a disciple, then maybe a little shame's coming your way. But other than that, if you're a first-timer, you're new to the faith, no problem. If you had two to three yeses, then you are part of the crowd. Again, welcome. Everybody has to go through those, those levels of, of commitment. There's no, no problem with that unless that is your final destination. If you answered yes four, five, or six times, then you are a regular part of the congregation. And it is wonderful to have you among us as well. God bless you. In today's culture, that says something. Now, if you were able to answer yes seven or eight times, if you said yes seven or eight times, you are no doubt very committed. In today's society, that is a big deal. That is, that, that is good for you. That is huge. That is a huge deal. Now, if you were able to say yes to nine or all ten of these questions, wow, you are absolutely part of a very dedicated and a very small number that can be called the core. In fact, I, go later, I, I call you hardcore <laughs> because you've earned it. That's no joke. That sounds like a committed disciple of Christ who is all in, who is happy to be used by the Lord in any way, whatever is awesome. I commend you. As your pastor, I, I want you to hear me say, well done. You are faithful, and you can be counted on in every way. So how'd you do? Look one last time. Do you see where you were? Are you happy with where you landed? If not... I got great news, man. 2019 is still ahead of us. We're going to jettison 2018. We're going to move forward, and we are going to see. See, this is just a mirror. This holds us up. Some of you are very happy with where you landed, and you probably should be. And, you know, this was just like holding up a mirror, but maybe it revealed that you want to take another step in your commitment to the Lord or another step deeper this year in your commitment to his church. For some, this was a mirror to say, you know what? I see where I stand, and I want to change that. Remember, if you don't get challenged here to grow spiritually, where will you? It's not going to happen out there. I guarantee you none of us are going to go to work tomorrow. They're going to come in and go, by the way, I'm giving you a new raise if you be more like Jesus this year. It's probably not going to happen. In fact, you're going to feel the pressure to be just the opposite, to be like everybody else. Your time the way everybody else does. To invest in your entertainment and put things in your mind, in your head, in your heart, just like every other person. But Jesus calls us to be different. He calls us to stand out, 
to stand up. And I want to challenge you to grow. In fact, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have our instrumentalists come up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a, a story here as we land. And then I want to have a time of prayer. So if, you, if you're an instrumentalist and you want to play on this final, final tune, go ahead and come up. And while they do, I'm going to put two movies up on the screen. Raise your hand if you are at all familiar with either of these. Anybody recognize where this is going? I want to show you something very powerful. There was a famous director named Cecil B. DeMille and also William Wyler. And these two got together, and they were legendary directors of biblical epics. And when they started working on Ben-Hur, shortly before Cecil B. DeMille died, they got together with their star, Charlton Heston. That's the guy on the left. He played Moses, and he played in, in Ben-Hur, and this was this incredible actor. And they got together and they said, we want to do something very different. At the end of this movie, there is an all-important chariot race. It's an incredible scene. If you haven't seen it, it is amazing. They decided that Charlton Heston should actually go learn how to drive the chariot for himself four abreast horses to go because it would be so much more believable than using a stunt double and somebody else faking it or just going through the motions. Heston agreed and he says, I will go and I will take lessons. I will learn how to drive a chariot and I will make this as authentic as possible. So he went and learned how to drive a chariot, four horses abreast, taking extensive lessons, hard work, days and days and days of practice. They stopped filming and finally Charlton Heston returned to the He said, think I can now drive the chariot okay, but I am not at all sure I can actually win this race. You know what the director said? He shook his head, he waved him off, and he smiled at him. He said, Charlton Heston, your job is just to stay in the race. I will make sure you win. Think about that. Think about that. I believe our Heavenly Father says to every one of us during these crazy times in which we live and we're trying to be disciples and sold out for Him, you just stay in the race. I'm going to take care of your finish line. If you just stay committed, if you just stay in the race, just run your race. You be you and follow me. And don't you worry about these other distractions. I will take care of the finish line. For some of you, I know 2018 has been tough. It has been rough. For some of us, we have had a hard year and it has been quite tough taxing. And if that's you, I say this to you. Look for God's hand in 2019. If you can't see it right now in the storm that you're in, if you can't see God's hand, you can't trace it in the as you put your life back together. Because I read God's word and he says, where two or more have gathered, there he is in the midst. And a cord of three is not easily broken. And I see these things and I know, God, you've promised that I am not alone. He is guiding us. He sees around every corner. He's in your darkest situations. He's in your financial trouble right now. He's in your health crisis. He's with your family friction. He sees all that nothing is wasted with God. So this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to leave you with your weekly truth grenade to take with you into the new year. It comes courtesy of Philip Yancey, and it's one sentence long. It's so profound. You want to write it down, or you want to get out your phone, and you want to snap a picture of this. It's so simple. When we step out in faith, faith means trusting in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Take that with you. Trusting in advance. God, I can't see where this road is. I'm going to step out. I'm going to trust you because your word says I am never alone. I'm going to trust you. You say don't go it alone, and I am not going to go it alone, and I don't see where this is going, but I'm going to trust you. I'm stepping out of faith. I am being obedient. And one day when I get down this road, I'm going to be able to turn and look in reverse and see where I've been. And then I'm going to say, oh my goodness, I get it. This makes sense. Now, the end of your road, that moment, it may be face to face with Jesus in glory, but it will come. And you will see and you will understand all through this. As we step out in faith, God is there. If you didn't like your 2018, or even if you did, if you're ready to take it to the next level, I hope we will step out of faith this coming year and take our spiritual health to a whole new level. I challenge each one of us, if you're hearing my voice, if you're watching online, to strengthen your commitment to reading his word, to being with like-minded believers, to investing in the life of your children, getting them here every time the doors are open. Let's deepen our commitment to the Lord, to his kingdom, to his church, and make 2019 an incredible year, knowing you are not alone. So here's what we're going to do. In just a minute, I'm going to ask us all to stand. 
The band's going to play. I think we're just going to go instrumental. And I'm going to open the altar. And I just want to pray for you. I like to do this at the end or the start of every year. We're going to open the altar. And if you can get down here, I want to pray for you. Maybe you want to come with your family. I know we have the little scudders in here with us today. I'm going to have my family down here. And maybe you want to pray for them. I want to pray for God's richest blessings and for his protection over you. I want to pray for your health. I want to pray for your finances. I want to pray for your testimony, for your family and your, your, your parents and your kids. Maybe you want to come and you just want to go away with a fresh vision. Ask God for it. Don't be content to just paddle around in the kiddie pool when he's got a great big ocean. The days are getting shorter and darker. And God is calling us to be the church. Will you meet with him? Will you commit to make 2019 more intense fire and passion for your Savior? I hope so. I pledge that. Let's stand together. And you can pray where you are. If you want to come down, maybe you want to kneel with your family and just have a moment with him, come join me. The altar is open. We'll spend a moment in prayer, and then I'll pray for each one of us before we go.